So I read a news article recently with the headlines, image obsessed people are faking vacations with professional photo editing. Okay? Image obsessed people faking vacations with professional photo editing. So basically what's going on is that there's this growing trend on things like Instagram and Facebook where you and your friends are at times posting images of your vacations except that you are doctoring those photos, right? You're photoshopping them in some way, shape, or form. You are, are twisting the image to make it look like your vacations are better than they actually are. And I say you because there's been studies done on this now and 14%, 14% of images posted on Facebook and on Instagram and on sites like that, 14% of them quit, quote, fibbed to others about their flashy vacations. That's like one out of every six, right? What's the motivation behind this? Why would someone want to in some way make it look like their vacation is more exotic than it originally is or say that they've gone somewhere maybe that they haven't gone? What would be the motivation in kind of changing for the world to see and lying really at the end of the day about where you've been vacationing? Well, in our digital era, people's digital personas, the image that we create and we put online that everyone else sees, that digital persona seems far better than our real life one. Because what happens is, what is it that you post and share with the world? What do your friends post and share? Usually all the good stuff, right? You make yourself look as good as possible, the best pictures as possible. You get to carefully choose what words it is that you share with the world. And the reality then is that this persona, this image of people that we get online, usually looks far better than the world that we're living ourselves. And so what is now rather endemic is that people are embarrassed by reality. We're embarrassed by it. What's reality? Zits, right? Double chins. Oftentimes, bad hair days. Or maybe not having enough money to go on really nice vacations. Or when you do go on those vacations, they end up not looking anything like they do on the postcards. And so life is so glitzed up online that we at times are very embarrassed about our normal lives. Because in fact, what's real life like? Real life usually isn't the prettiest thing in the world. Real life can be very hard. Work can be very hard, if you have a job even. There's sickness, there's bullies, there's expectations of ours that on a very regular basis can be dashed. And it looks like everyone else has it better than us. Have you ever caught yourself thinking this way? Everyone else seems to have life better than me. Ever catch yourself thinking that way? The reality, though, is that this is a distorted view of reality. And you know this. If we just pause and think about it and think through it, we know that it's distorted to think that everyone has it better than ourselves. But I think this sometimes happens in the Christian community as well. Maybe we had expectations for what religious or spiritual life should be like, especially life after the empty tomb. Hmm? So think of what those disciples must have been thinking when they met that resurrected Jesus at that very first Easter. Jesus is victorious, he's risen. Now things are going to be different. Or maybe think of how you felt this past Easter Sunday. Jesus is victorious, he's risen. Now things are going to be different. And was work any different when you got back to work on Tuesday? Or was it the same hard driving boss? the same demanding customers, the same sins that we struggle with, the same hardships. And so it can feel as if life's really no different. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it was written for one purpose and one purpose only, to show us that life after the resurrection isn't the same. That to think that it is is a distorted view of reality. 
And so Jesus gives John a vision to correct our thinking, to pull back the veil, to see life as it really is, and to see that you got it better than you could have ever faked it. And so he begins his revelation, John, with these words, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and to take heart what is written in it, because the time is near. So what's the book of Revelation's purpose laid out right here in the very few verse, very first few verses? On the one hand, it's to take to heart, to take heart what's written here. Why? Because the time is near. What does it mean to take something to heart or why do we need to take these words to heart? This is going to be a letter that gives us hope gives us hope despite what things look like. And maybe think of all the verses in Scripture that tells us to take heart in the psalmist that says, be strong and take heart all who hope in the Lord. But why at this time do we need to take heart? In every epic film or every epic story, there is a point when you reach what's called the climax, but it's usually the lowest point in the story, right? It's the point when things are so bad, it looks as if the powers of evil are going to win and there's no possible way that we can overcome these difficulties, but you know, because you know that you're watching a story or a movie, you know that you just cannot simply guess how things are going to work out, but they will work out, that there will be this turn that takes place despite what things look like. You know that at one moment, Gandalf is going to appear on the horizon with all of those reinforcements. You know that maybe somehow, even if you can't expect it, there will be that arrow that is able to pierce the armor of the dragon and to bring him down. John says we are living in that moment right now, this moment where things look as if they are bad, but we know if we just take heart and put our hope, we know that the ending is soon to come, that that turn will take place soon. And what is it that will happen? He says the time is near. The time is near. When did John write this? 1,000... 900 years ago, 2,000 years ago, he said the time is near. Was John wrong? Did he get something screwed up here? When he says the time is near, he's not talking about time in the sense of actual minutes and hours. He's talking about chronological time. He's thinking more of time as time works in baseball. So if you are in the ninth inning of a baseball game and it's the bottom of the ninth and there are two strikes, you know that there is only one thing that needs to happen to bring that ending. You are looking for one more strike and then the end is to come. You are near to the end. But how long can it take for that last strike? It could theoretically take hours, weeks, years. But the time is near and you know it is near and so you are sitting on the edge of your seat waiting because you know that there is the moment that is coming that you are very close to the end of it. And we are sitting then at this very same time period, says John, it is near. We are on the edge of our seats waiting for that turn. But what end is it that we are waiting for? What happens after that final strike? The end, judgment day. The full festival that awaits in heaven, the end of pain and sorrows and the new beginning to the new world of righteousness and justice and purity and holiness that waits for us with our God. But we are waiting. We are waiting. There is one more strike that needs to happen. And it doesn't look like it at times. So... What was John doing at this moment? Why was he writing this letter? 
Where are we in the history of the Christian church? 50 years earlier, Jesus died on that cross and rose from the grave. And then his disciples went out, his apostles went out into the world. And for 50 years, that gospel has been going out. But how has that gospel been spreading? How are the apostles doing? They are, in fact, at this time, all murdered. They are all dead to a man except one, John. And John is in exile on this island of Patmos because of his faith. See, first, under the persecution of, of many of the Jewish religious leaders, like we read in Acts, there was all of this hostility and jailing of, Jew, of early Christians and martyring of early Christians like Stephen. But then even after that, then we had emperors like Nero and Domitian that put forth policies that made it very difficult to be Christians and made persecution very widespread. And now all of the greatest leaders of the church are either dead or in exile. What does it look like to John? But John says, take heart, take heart. The end is near. Things are not as they look. And you know it. When something terrible happens, we often distort the way that we look at the world. We often make it look like things are way worse than they are because we are forgetting very key truths. We are forgetting very key facts and realities that no matter how bad things look in life, the reality is far different. And so Jesus gives John this revelation and he gives him a vision that is going to correct this distorted view of reality that at this time, we are going to be able to find something that tells this John that he is not alone on this island and that you and I are not alone in our own islands of hardship in this life. And so Jesus appears to John and John gets to see things and John gets to see Jesus as he actually is. And Jesus begins with these words, I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. What was it like on Good Friday for those Jewish followers? It must have looked like things couldn't possibly get worse. It must have looked as if good could have certainly not triumphed. But if they had had the eyes of faith, what would they have seen on that cross? But they would have seen God come down to earth victorious over sin, death, and the devil. And as that body got hung on the cross, if they had the eyes of faith to see, what would they have been seeing but Jesus himself stepping willingly between all of God's wrath on you and me and taking it on himself instead. And when they saw that body being taken down off the cross, did they have the eyes of faith to see that it was a sacrifice being brought down from the cross, a sacrifice given for us, the sacrifice we had been waiting all of history for. But three days later, three days later, their vision got corrected, and they got to see not only that this Jesus was alive, but that he was powerful and glorious, and those followers on Easter, they didn't even get to begin to get a glimpse of what Jesus is like. Here we get to see even further the gloriousness and the power and the victory that Christ has because of his resurrection for us. And what does Jesus actually look like? What does that dusty carpenter actually look like? I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and among the lampstands, was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth, was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. That is your savior. 
And what does he look like, your living and resurrected and ruling Savior? The point here is not to analyze every detail, but to give us a forceful, powerful image. But some of these details, man alive. Jesus has a sword coming out of his mouth, a giant sword. What impression does that give you? Is this simply a meek, worthless criminal that died on a cross? This is the greatest warrior that ever existed, that on the last day will come not only as a savior, but as a ruling king over all of this universe to exact all of his rule as the greatest warrior of all time. He's got a face like the sun. Can you think of other times in scripture when God is described as having something like this? Think maybe of the glory of God shown on Mount Sinai like lightning or like a sun on top of that mountain. Or maybe, think maybe a little bit even closer, that transfiguration when Jesus revealed himself, peeled back the curtain just a little bit and shone like the sun on the top of that mountain top. Even more so, we see Jesus here in his full glory peeled back. But one of the coolest parts of this, greater than his glowing aura and this giant sword coming out of his mouth, is he is holding seven stars, seven stars in his right hand. Who are these seven stars? What are these seven stars? Revelation itself tells us that these are the congregations that this letter is meant for. The seven congregations. In other words, who does God, who does this Jesus hold in his right hand? You and me, all Christians right there in the hand of this righteous and this powerful God. When you are going through hardships and when you are picturing your Savior, do not picture him standing next to you. Picture him holding you, holding you up because that is where you really are. So do you ever find yourself telling yourself that all is lost, that there's no way that things can work out, that things are doomed, that this can't end well? When you feel this way, John says, read this. Take heart. Take heart because the end is near. It will work out. I promise you and I know this because Jesus himself told it to me, John says. And he says, I want Jesus to tell it to you too. And so when you feel this way and when you feel the pressures and the weight of living in that final inning, in that final half of the inning, in that final, waiting for that final pitch, when you feel the weight of it, John says, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, and read it over and over and over and over again until you have corrected your distorted view of reality and you see things as they actually are. Everything will be all right. Why? Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, the peace that is yours, that peace that you can access right from Scripture, in the midst of your turbulence, that peace that transcends all understanding may dwell richly in your hearts and in your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.